Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar. Yet me talk number six with the topic uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence platform for oil and gas uh, drilling. So this is basically uh, the main topic is uh, machine learning and AI. It is regarding the interly uh, and machine learning and the AI platform, a product by uh, RigNet. Um, my name is Ren Wijaya. I'm the moderator for this uh, event. I'm the senior drilling engineer for Pertamina Hulu, Pertamina Hulu Energy, subholding upstream and the drilling and well intervention group. And then uh, before we jump to, uh, to the main agenda, basically for today or tonight's uh, yet new talk series, we, we will have some agenda. There will be some opening uh, remarks from Mr. Henke and then Mrs. Uh, Susanna. The introduction for the presenter, uh, the main topic, presentation from Dr. Borella, Q&A session, and we will close this uh, event with the photo session, and then there will be closing remarks from the moderator. Before we jump to the main agenda, uh, we will have uh, two opening remarks, as I mentioned. The first one will be the opening remarks from the IATMI representation as the host, Mr. Henrikus Herwin, or we can call him Mr. Henke. Good evening, Mr. Henke. Mr. Henke. Mr. Henke good, is. Good evening, the, yes. Good evening. <laughs> Mr. Henke is the head of uh, Division Regional Section and Student Chapter of IATMI, and he is also uh, the Vice President in Pertamina Hulu Energy. Uh, VP of Technical Excellence and uh, Coordination, TEC. And then uh, the second opening remarks, there will be from Geoservices representation, Mrs. Susanna Mokalu. Mrs. Susanna, good evening, Bu. Good evening, Pa. Mrs. Susanna is the Business Development Manager uh, at Geoservices. Okay, uh, I think uh, we can start with the opening remarks from the host, from IATMI representation, Mr. Henke. The time is yours. Terima kasih, Pak Rian. Uh, good morning, Dr. Borella, and good evening for everyone in Indonesia. So I see that uh, we have uh, more than 40 participants. Uh, it's a very good uh, turnout for a Friday night, Friday night talk. Uh, welcome once again to Yatmi Talk number six. Uh, every month, Yatmi uh, will try to uh, bring uh, interesting uh, subject in order to uh, upskill and also improve the competency of oil and gas uh, professional in Indonesia, especially uh, for uh, Yatmi member. So tonight we have the honor uh, of the presence of uh, Dr. Augusto Borella, or we call uh, Dr. Borella from uh, Inteli. Uh, he is going to talk about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence platform for oil and gas uh, drilling. So uh, it's a very uh, relevant topic uh, for for uh, for today in our industry. Uh, in order us to uh, perform our job uh, faster, better, and uh, cheaper if possible. Uh, I would like also to uh, thank uh, Geoservice to make this uh, talk uh, possible uh, by introducing us to uh, Dr. Borella. I think with further ado, uh, I will uh, say uh, thank you once again and uh, enjoy the talk. Thank you so much, uh, Panky, for the opening remarks from the IATMI representation as the host for today. The next, uh, there will be opening speech or remarks from uh, your, your services side, Ibu Susana. Ibu Susana, the time is yours, Bu, to okay. deliver a speech. Thank you, Pak Rian, uh, and thank you, Pak Henrikus. Uh, first of all, on behalf of your services, of course, uh, we are the one who thank you for the opportunity given to. Uh, 
to introduce our partner in Tally uh, uh, to give the talk for the EADME members for this knowledge sharing basically uh, on this machine learning uh, on this machine learning for oil and gas and and we are uh, we are really glad to be able to be given this opportunity because actually at first I spoke to Pak Hadi Ismoyo and Pak Bambang Ismanto and so my special thanks uh, my special thanks to Pak Hadi Ismoyo and Pak Bambang Ismanto who who actually given the, who opens the door uh, who opens the door talk to Iatmi talk to Iatmi and uh, because uh, we have this Iatmi talk uh, so rather than I have to go uh, uh, door knocking for <laughs> on any for each company now uh, we are given uh, the opportunity for, for to for Italy to talk in this Iatmi uh, Iatmi gathering knowledge sharing uh and i won't i won't steal the limelight uh i will give the time for for uh, dr borella to to give his speech and uh give his uh, knowledge sharing in this and for people sometimes for people sometimes it's still oh your service is a slumberger company no we are not we are a local company <laughs> We are the local company, the 50 years local company. Some people probably knows like, oh, Joseph is Paong. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Susanna. Thank you so much, Susanna, for uh, the opening remarks. Very warm. Thank you very much, Bu. OK, uh, now we are heading to our main agenda. Uh, we do have uh, currently we do have 46, 46 participants in our uh, Zoom meeting, Zoom webinar. Without further any twist or delay, we will turn uh, the time over to the presenter. Our presenter today is Dr. Borella. Here is the short uh, biography of uh, Dr. Borella. Dr. Borella is the VP or Vice President of Oil and Gas Products. Uh, currently in Tele. Previously worked at Petrobras Brasileiro as a drilling engineer, R&D manager, technical competency manager, and most recently, digital transformation general manager. Got the doc doctorate in science uh, from Sao Paulo University in Brazil, yeah, uh, Dr. Borella. Just a little uh, housekeeping before we get started. I will start to mention some webinar rules. Uh, they will, this, uh, this is, will be such an interesting uh, topic, talking about the machine learning, uh, the machine learning very familiar in uh, the marketing, the marketplace, everybody know about the uh, machine learning and AI. Okay, uh, there will be some uh, webinar rules. Uh, I hope that uh, all you guys, all the participants uh, listen to these uh, webinar rules. First one, uh, any provocation or harassment related to ethnic, religion, race, or sexual content are prohibited. Participants are not allowed to turn on their microphone and video during webinar, except with the permission from the moderator. It is prohibited to screen capture or record to respect the copyright. And then if you do have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the message box in your uh, Zoom chat box. I will bring them up at the end of the presentation and we'll also have time for Q&A session for you guys who are really willing to directly uh, speak or ask a question, post a question to Dr. Borella. At the end, there will be an uh, opportunity to ask the doctor at the end where the, particip the participants are allowed to uh, directly ask uh, Dr. Borella with the permission from the moderator. Okay, uh, Dr. Borella, I think uh, the time now is yours to have some presentation, knowledge sharing about uh, the topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today with you all. I'd like first to thank uh, the ITME uh, event organization for the invitation and also a special thanks to Susanna and Geo Services to connecting us for today. 
I really hope that you enjoy uh, the presentation aspect to bring reflections about the challenges related to apply machine learning and AI uh, as a way to leverage data value and uh, to do that with speed. Uh, uh, so uh, let's, let's uh, start here from a brief uh, comment from uh, Intelli. Intelli is a Brazilian uh, technology, technology company that has many accolades along his, its history. Intelli started, uh, has not started, it started in 2008, but not in the oil and gas industry. They, they started to work in the oil and gas industry in 2014. So because the platform that we have, it's uh, a platform that allows to optimize critical operations uh, for any industry. Of course, you can create uh, tools and, and apps that can accelerate specific businesses uh, as we did for oil and gas industry. And our platform is specialized to deal with high frequency data in a high amount and stream this data to connect with machine learning and, uh, and uh, simulation models. Uh, we have now, nowadays uh, offices in Houston, London, Rio de Janeiro, and Sao Paulo. Of course, uh, we, we have partners in many places in the world, and we are represented by, by Rignet in other, uh, almost all around the world. So nowadays, we have uh, 100 plus, more than 190 employees, and we keep growing based on the demand uh, and the, on the growth of the activities that we have uh, performed. So uh, I, I will start, before talking about machine learning and AI, I, I really like to come to the basics, okay? And uh, I, why I'm going to do that? Because during my experience, as uh, we, we presented, uh, in my career, I, I had the position to be the head for digital transformation, a uh, big operator for downstream and upstream. I saw many different projects of machine learning and AI starting to be a machine learning model uh, project, but ended up to be a data quality pro uh, project. So uh, I will contextualize that. And uh, later on, we are going to deep dive on the elements of machine learning and, and AI. And, uh, Part of the contextualization is also related with the speed that technology is evolving. We need to keep up with this evolution of the technology to guarantee that our companies and our businesses keep relevant. Uh, we tried here to illustrate how, how long innovations needed to reach 50 million of users. The, for example, the telephone took 50 years the television, 22 years, uh, internet, seven, Facebook, four, and Pokemon Go, 19 but days. So that illustrates how technology is evolving pretty fast and companies to keep relevant need to evolve fast with the technologies. And some technologies, and I will not only mention machine learning and AI, but I will mention also uh, real-time simulations, are key to transform the way that we operate. And that's what is going to bring value to our industry. And when we talk about industries, from one perspective, with the amount of available technology, as uh, Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, has been mentioning, in 10 years, every company will be a tech company. The difference among them is just the way that they use that technology and in which problem they apply the technology. So an oil and gas operator will be an oil and gas, will be a technology company that runs oil and gas activities and processes. A drilling contractor will be a technology company that run uh, and, uh, operations and activities of uh, drilling, uh, managing drilling rigs. And beside that, uh, just a, a technical note here, we need to remember that Satya Nadella led a, a digital transformation at Microsoft. It's not uh, common to think about that because uh, Microsoft started as a technology company, but they had to change their business model. 
they focused in beginning to deploy operational system for desktops. And Satya Nadella led the, the, the movement to Microsoft to become a cloud provider in Azure. And that was a big change for them. They highly changed their, their way of, of operating their business. So if that's, go, that's happening with uh, technology companies, that's going to happen also to, with all companies. So that's why we need to take a, look, a deep look on what the capabilities that the new technologies, the emergent technologies, allows us to use and apply in our business. And on the other hand, we have the way that we deal with data. Uh, data are, are not uh, treated as they should. So here we have the, the magazine, The Economist, that in, two, in 2017 mentioned that the world's most valuable resource nowadays is data. But if data is a valuable resource, we need to process that. We need to process this resource to deliver value to our companies. And one of the ways to process the data in order to reach value, to treat the data as an asset, is to apply machine learning models, is to apply artificial intelligence. And we are going uh, later on, go a little bit deeper on, on, on some details on, about that. So we need speed and we need uh, to respect the data treat the data as an asset and gather the value that really uh, the data can deliver to us. And it's very common and, and, and feel comfortable if you think about your daily basis and you say, I'm not extracting the whole value of my data because it's been very common nowadays. All companies and all industries has room to improve on that. It's the first step is to really look to the data, not as a number or as a, a bit or as a, a text, but look at the data as something that can generate value. That's the first important mindset change that we need to bring to the table to start delivering value from the data. So how do we do that? So based on my experience, what should, uh, uh, and uh, here is adapted from Gartner. Gartner is a uh, IT consulted company that has many uh, valuable articles. So how to make the digital transformation in order to deliver value from the data, which are the, uh, the elements that are involved on that to, when we try to treat data as a center, uh, central element. So we have three, three elements, technology, processes, and people. Uh, the, 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 the least difficult to deal with is the technology aspect. Why? We have many available emergent technologies that we are not getting, gathering the maximum value of them. They are just available and they are uh, using them less, generating less value than we should. So the first thing that we need to think about technology as uh, engineers that work in a, in a specific industry, in our case here, oil and gas industries, are we capturing the whole valuable that the, the the whole value that the available technology allows us to capture usually the answer is no so the problem is not the technology technology is a, it's it's available the, the challenge is how do we apply this technology in our business and here we have the two key elements processes and people so we need to change the processes in a way that we capture this value from the technology and we need also to integrate uh, processes in a way that one process feed the other one and we have some fluidity in the way that we operate and we, we, we do things in the daily basis. But the key element is people. Applying new technologies is a human journey that we have facing since the very beginning of the humanity. It's the process of human beings transferring mechanical activities to machines and humans empowering themselves with more human activities. What type of activity we call as being human? It's to apply creativity, to deal with ambiguity, to deal with uncertainty. These are activities prone to humans. Uh, humans are not good to doing repetitive activities or to be online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We need to rest. 
So machines can do that. So every mechanical task we should transfer to machines to guarantee that they do that with uh, repeatability and they are all the time online. But we need to be working critically when paradoxes are in place, when ambiguity is in place, when uncertainty is in place. We have a lot of value to bring there. So here is the key. Uh, and one, uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is at the end of the day, processes also depend on people because it's people who write the processes. So uh, people are, are, are key to lead and to make this transformation happen, but we need to move from fear to inspiration. And usually peer, people are is inspired to change the way that they do things when we are able to show them the new thing that they are going to do. So we are going to transform the way that we do things. And we need to understand that, we need to communicate that to the, to the, the professionals in a way that you can eliminate fear and show that the new job that they are going to do is more prone to people, for people doing, and they are going to be more fulfilled with this new job that is related with uh, dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity, for example. So based on that, we need to unlearn things and relearn the new things because the, the technologies bring new scenarios bring the need of new skills and new knowledge. So now uh, we need to reconfigure the way that we see the world every time we have a new technology. And we need to rethink everything, processes, uh, methodologies, uh, how we deliver value, how do we communicate value? It's very challenging for those that are working with AI and machine learning to communicate to executives the value that they are going to deliver. Because executives are very anxious to have short-term results and sometimes when we talk about machine learning we don't have enough data annotated or collected to train a model so we need some room to train the model that they can take time and sometimes and it's very difficult to communicate that to executives that's one important uh, challenge here is how to communicate value when we are talking about uh, machine learning and ai projects and I would like to mention Alvin Toffler, that's an American writer and futurist, that said that the illiterate in the 21st century not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And I can guarantee to you, I moved, I unlearned things and I learned new things that allowed me to move from an operator to a technology company. Uh, really reconfigured my consciousness to be able to work in this new technology. This, new, this new company. And that I, I think that was very important and was a key element for my career because the knowledge that I learned in the university is not used, useful anymore. I had to learn, uh, uh, learn what I learned, learn new things and apply those new things in the, the daily basis to acquire new skills and new knowledge. But not only skills and knowledge are going to allow us to capture the value from the data. Another key dimension is to embrace new attitudes. We may have the skill, we may have the knowledge, but we need to have uh, new attitudes. So here is it's a, 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 a joke with the film Two Popes. We have pictures from the two popes announcements, Benedict XVI in 2005, Francis I in 2013. In the left, we can we see no one with smartphones taking pictures. In the right, we see almost everybody taking pictures with their smartphones or filming to remember in the future their experience or to share the moment with people that is not in, in, the, in, the, in the pope place. And here a technical element. We need to remember that the smartphone, as we know today, even though we take as granted that we have all, we always had smartphones, was launched for the first time in 2007 by Apple with iPhone one. So, but having the iPhone or the smartphone in our pockets will not guarantee that we are going to share the, the moment with 
the, belong, the, the beloved ones that are far away. We need to have the attitude to take the smartphone, to, to pick up the smartphone from, from our pocket, take the picture and share the moment. So not only the technology needs to be available, but the human beings need to have the attitude to use the technology. This is a pretty, a pretty simple example based on our daily basis behavior, but we need to extrapolate that to our uh, daily basis activity in our industry. We need to challenge the, our attitude uh, to, towards technology. Are we embracing this new technology? Are we changing our attitude? Are we learning new skills that will allow us to gather the value from, from this new technology? If we answer yes, you are in the right direction. If you answer no, or maybe, we need to focus on that and improve the, the, the energy that we, we are putting on that, because it's very critical. And for sure, what we learned today, maybe in two or three years, even less, we are going to need to unlearn and relearn something else to keep up with the new technologies that are going to be uh, released in the future. So, and data also is the way. So now we are going to connect the human dimension with the data dimension. Uh, we, we are very based, really based on individual knowledge. We take decisions based on our experience Usually industries uh, rely on people experience to take decisions. And the way that corporations get experience is by collecting data. So when we say you should collect data in real time, high frequency, we are saying corporation, you should be collecting, creating your experience. The data that you collect is your experience. And when we compare a, a people, a person lifetime working on offshore industry, the whole 30 year experience of one person in, in our industry is equivalent of a continuous, a seven years of continuous operation of 24 hours a day, seven days per week. So a person takes 30 years to get the same experience as a, a, a company that has one rig in the fleet. But let's imagine that our company has seven rigs in the fleet. We can collect the same amount of experience for the corporation in one year that one, that one person would take 30 years to collect. And if we had 14 rigs, a company can uh, equal the one person 30 years career in six months. If we had 28 rigs, we could equal one person career in three months. That's huge. And we need to change this mindset. We need to accept that we are not that special when we talk about uh, gathering experience and knowledge. The machine and the data collection, it's much stronger than us. And we need to find ways how to leverage the value of this data and create a corporate experience and corporate knowledge to make better decisions as individuals, to share this, this corporate knowledge with the individuals. That's very key uh, change. Uh, we don't have right answers. Companies are in different levels of maturity. You are going to listen to me to tell that many times during this presentation, companies are in different levels of maturity. We should go in this direction. This is a vision. But we have a long journey for doing that. And how do we do that? At the end of the day, one important question is, Borella, how can we, once it's important to create a corporate knowledge, how can we do that? Uh, in terms of data management, I would suggest four important perspectives. One is the data birth. Usually you don't think about that, but how the data that we are going to use to take decision is birth, is born. Uh, in the past, almost many data was uh, born by people typing in the keyboard. But when a person types the data, we, we give room for mis mistyping, errors of, of typing. Maybe it's not updated, 
because people people may fail to be our, uh, online 24 hours a day. They need to go to, to, to have lunch. They need to stop to do to go to the restroom. So people may uh, have a lack of data when we rely on people typing data. And that's what uh, IoT, the IoT concept brought to the table. We can create, we can put in place sensors that allows us to observe the reality and we can connect the real world to the digital world. So with that, we guarantee that the data borns and allows us to, allows us to, to have the data updated. Another element that can uh, create the, 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 the birth of, of data is the flow, the, the process flow integration. When we automate workflows, when we integrate workflows, variables that are created inside a process can feed another process and generate the, the birth of data that are going of data that is be useful in another moment in another process. So data integration also is pretty uh, important, not only to give fluidity to the processes and to automate and redu reduce the cost of the processes, but also to guarantee that all possible data is born. For example, an example of, of data that is an outcome from a process that can feed another one is uh, KPIs. So performance KPIs can feed a process that automates uh, optimization decisions. So we, we have a process that calculates the KPI and you can use this result of the KPI to feed another process that will define what we need to do once the performance is bad or what we need to do once the, the variability of this operation is high. Okay, so those two on the top are pretty straightforward. I'm not going to deep dive on them, but now I'm going to the deep dive on how to generate business value from uh, business results from data and how to, 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 uh, to classify levels of automations related to decisions and actions. So first, and here is a, a, an important moment where we connect, uh, where we connect data to, to, to result. We are lacking here the data word. So we have data here. Okay, so we start from the data. We analyze the data and we get some information. When we interpret this information, we have a knowledge. When we model this knowledge, we have a strategic intelligence. Only when we apply systematically this strategic intelligence, we have a business result for generating value to our stakeholders. And what, uh, what is important here, and we forget many times, usually we come just to the level of knowledge. Let's create a knowledge, but it's not enough to generate value. You need to go beyond that. And what differentiates companies, it's how they take business decisions. And the business decisions are reflected in the way that we model the knowledge to, to create a strategic intelligence and the way that we apply that systematically. And that's why a platform is pretty important because a way to apply a business decision systematically or strategic intelligence systematically, we need a platform that allows us to put supervisory functions or models that will be uh, analyzing in real time all the data that uh, arises in the company and take the proper actions. And exactly at that moment, when we manage this whole workflow properly, is when we start to create a corporate knowledge management. Because we use data, we use information to create knowledge, to create strategic intelligence, and we share that with humans, so humans can drive the machine learning models, can give feedbacks to improve the machine learning models. And machine learning and AI potentialize that very much because allows to, to automate this whole process, connecting data directly to the business result and guaranteeing that we are applying systematically. When we put online a machine learning model that is feeded by real-time data, we are being successful in delivering systematic application. And it's when we get a, a result. 
the way that companies deal with that usually is to create procedures, train people, and expect that people are going to apply systematically. But we cannot guarantee that. When we put in place a real-time machine learning model, we guarantee that. If the data is, uh, is coming, if the service is online, we can guarantee that we are systematically applying the model and delivering results to our, to our uh, customers. The other, and just exactly related with the strategic intelligence, is the process of taking decisions and actions from uh, what we, we have modeled. So uh, we have, inside the companies, we have different uh, levels, uh, different, uh, we have processes in all of those levels of automations. Sometimes more processes are descriptive and less processes are prescriptive. We need to move uh, uh, the amount, increase the amount of processes that are prescriptive. That's the vision. And we do that in the daily basis. We choose the, the process that has more results to deliver to the company, and we try to automate it. We try to automate decision, and after decision, we try to automate the action. The, the level of confidence that we have in the model, in the automation model, we will define if we have confidence to eliminate humans in the process or not. Uh, that's, it's a very technical decision based on the, the maturity of the model. Uh, of course, the expectation of executives that is that we automate everything, decisions and actions. It's very easy to be said, it's not easy to be done. So we need to keep improving, augmenting the number of, of processes that are prescriptive, that we know how to automate decision and that we know to automate action. It's very common to have models where we have a, a, a human acknowledgement here to guarantee that we are the, the recommendation of the model is good. We ask somebody to validate that. And that's an example of human and machine learning symbiosis. Is when a machine learning uh, a machine learning model is still increasing its maturity and we need to have a, a person in the workflow to guarantee that the recommendation is okay before taking an action. And when we, we do that, we start to get confidence in the model. And once the confidence is in place, we can move to fully automate the action. But we are going to still to need humans here in this step. And that's a new task that humans are doing when we talk about machine learning is giving feedbacks to the machine learning models, is giving feedback to the artificial intelligence models. And this feedback we call la labeled, labeled data or annotated data. Okay? That's why it's pretty common when we start a machine, machine learning or AI model to ask how many data we have annotated. Because at the end of the day, machine learning models and AI models, they emulate the way that people uh, decide. And to emulate how people decide, they need to uh, have a reference to train the model. And this reference is previous human labeled or human annotated data where the machine learning model can experiment and learn to emulate this behavior. If we don't have enough human data annotated, we need to have human acknowledge and collect this data. If you have enough, we can train and rely on the model to take direct actions. That's the journey. That's the journey that every company is doing. Even Tesla, that it's an example of company very far uh, in the maturity, very evolved in the maturity for automation. They still have some processes that depends on human acknowledgement. They have few processes fully automated, but they still have many processes based on human feedback. They are in their journey. They are ahead of us, but they are yet in the journey. So moving now to the, once we, we know how to treat data, we know how to deliver value from the data. We, know, we need also to know which are the technologies that we should be uh, getting the most value. Cloud architecture is a huge change in the IT uh, area. So now we don't need anymore to create uh, unique databases or unique systems. We can create a net of databases, a net of systems, and create communication protocols 
that uh, are based on the processes ma ma mapping and connect all these systems and guarantee that the, 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 the data is available for everybody in every system. Okay. Another technology, as I previously mentioned, is IoT, is the capability to gather data from the field and have the, the real world convergency with the digital world. So we have sensors collecting the data, we can visualize this data, we can put supervisory models to automatize actions and decisions uh, based on, on the company best practices protocols. And uh, an example of application, uh, huge capability to deliver results to our industries to have condition-based maintenance uh, using the, the IoT sensors. Machine learning and AI, it's, uh, uh, it's still a hype where people believe that we are using that at scale. It's not true. We should aim to use these models at scale, but we need to choose the right platform that allows us to, to that is a system that allows us to use machine learning and AI at scale. Uh, we can associate, I also mentioned before, we can associate as a input data or as a data that needs to be verified uh, is the business KPIs. And we can use business KPIs and business decisions to train machine learning models to automate decisions and actions. The point here is we are still doing a lot of machine learning on very ad hoc basis. We are doing just to solve one or two problems, but we are struggling to put that at scale and apply in everything, in, in every activity in, in, in the industry. That's part of, of the journey, the transformational journey. And, and when we have uh, software capabilities for automation and we are able to integrate systems, we should uh, really emphasize to, to automatize the design phase to guarantee that we have automated engineering workflows, that these workflows use the, pre the historical real-time data to, to feed the, 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 the design decisions, and we can create uh, rules, heuristics, abstractions to, to automatize the engineering decisions so we can reduce the, the transactional cost of creating uh, the design documentation. Okay. Uh, we, we have um, optimization opportunities from data integration. Uh, usually companies are uh, optimizing inside some specific area. Many indus industries, not only ours, are very silent especially for big companies, because you, you need different big structures to deal with the different topics. When we, we, we integrate those areas, those different areas, there is room to capture uh, a global optimum. And uh, so this is a value that is unleashed by integrating databases and integrating communication protocols among siloed areas. It's a huge opportunity here, and many companies are struggling with that. And when we talk about processes, we need to change those processes, reinvent them, rethink them in a way that we consider the emerging technologies that are available. We need to remember that sometimes when we wrote the process in a company, the, the current technologies are not available. So we need to rethink that. Should we change the process? And usually the answer is yes. We need to reinvent, change the process. So one way to measure the matur maturity of a company to transform the way that they operate is if they are open to change processes. If they are not open to change processes, usually they are not going to capture the maximum value of the of the of the emergent technologies that are uh, available today. Of course, there, there is room also for us to capture value from digitalization, to create databases that we can consult, that we can uh, uh, organize the data and generate information and gather uh, and create knowledge from this information. There is room here, but it's still more of the same. This is the basic. We should have done the digitalization stuff. Uh, but if you hadn't, we should start from here. There is a lot of room to capture value here. 
And once we have the data collected in structured, structured databases that we can consult and we can organize to generate information, we should look how can we change the way that we operate and how can we change the business model. This is another uh, picture adapted from Gartner. Uh, I, I brought my, my sauce here when I mentioned uh, I have separate suppliers and customers. It's pretty difficult to change the business case with the customer because uh, we need to convince the customer that in, uh, change the business model with the customer because we need to convince the customer that the proposed business model is good and sometimes it's not that easy. But it's much easier to change the business model with our suppliers. So, for example, one uh, customer of ours has put in their tender specification that their suppliers, that the drilling contractor should deliver real-time data, make the real-time data available 99% of the time. And if they hadn't the data available, they would apply a, 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 a contract value. They should pay a, a, an amount if they don't have uh, the, the data available. So that's a, a example how technology changed the business model because now they, 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 the, the supplier need to guarantee that the data is available just because the, the customer changed the specification of the tender. We have lots of room here to change the way that we operate. We need to operate differently using the new technology. Of course, we need to respect the safety elements. Our industry uh, has high risk associated and the consequences of a failure. But there, there is techniques to deal with uh, the, 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 the model's maturity and guarantee that we deploy only models that are working properly. And there's a lot of room to, to, to change the way the op that we operate. And which should be the driver? Every process that we perform in our business, we should try to reduce the, make the transactional cost 10 to zero. Because when we eliminate human activities and we put a, a machine to do the job, uh, the mechanical job, this cost tends to zero. That's an important driver to deliver business result in the process optimization. So here uh, I'm going to, to, to go a little bit faster here in the, the examples. There are many articles written on that. You can go through it uh, in, in, in the, the bibliography uh, available in the internet. So we have some customers that started creating an ontology in their database to classify, to classify the, the data and allow that they can create information. And they have aggregated this data, interpreted this data, then they identify it, uh, standard deviation or process or, or reduction or mean redu performance improvement in this database. And they could take business decisions. For example, here we have an operation with more than 50, a well construction operation with more than 50 operations. But we can easily, once we have an ontology and we have the right information, interpretation of the information from the data, we can see which are the operations that are critical to deploy this well. And we can focus on the four main operations with highest uncertainty to guarantee that we improve performance and we improve also the, the, the expectation, the duration expected uh, duration of the well, because that's a challenge for managers in well construction. We have uncertainty in the well duration that affects the budget uh, expectation. So we need to reduce the uncertainty related with well durations. Uh, another important example here is how to rethink the way that we do things. Usually we have uh, engineers in the fielding, defining the best CDS to be selected for uh, offshore operations, but should evaluate if the rig is the right rig to drill a well, because when we talk about uh, EDS, that is the emergence, emergency disconnection sequence, this, the selection depends on the BOP data, depends on the rig data, depends on the operational data, uh, which operation we are going to perform. And we should evaluate that since the very beginning, since the well program. But it's very challenging because there are many variables that need to be evaluated in hundreds of operational lines. 
So if you do not automate that, we cannot not evaluate that. And we, not, we do not control if we do not measure. So, and uh, when uh, one of our customers did that, this is another uh, public article that you can uh, look in the, look for in the internet. Uh, the same well drilled with rig one had a 13% of uh, duration that we could not shear uh, the tubular that would be in front of the BOP. And this is a huge uh, uh, operational risk. But on the other hand, rig four had 0.1% of, of duration without the capability to shear the tubular that is in front of the BOP. So what can we learn from rig one, four to share with rig one? When we, we are able to evaluate, we are able to create engineering rules that allows us to automate it and evaluate something that we were not evaluating in the past, we can improve the quality of the decisions that we take. That's an example of how we can automate engineering design process workflow and with that generate business result here, more safety for the operation and increase the corporate learnings from one rig to the other. Uh, once again, uh, the design automation workflow is pretty important. Usually the, the data la layer, our customers start the data federation. So the drilling engineer can in access one system and see all the data that is spread around different databases. That's what we call a data federation. That's an important step that the technology allows us to do that today. Uh, we can create an architecture of software that allows uh, the integration between different systems with internal and external protocols. Uh, the, the technical name uh, for the cloud architecture is APIs. And we need to align ontology. How do we classify the operations? How do we classify the data to guarantee that we have the right context and we can aggregate the data to create the right information and the right interpretation? And how do we automatize the knowledge application. Once again, we can share the, once we have the APIs for internal, external customers or uh, suppliers, we can share those APIs with universities or, and software house so they don't need to reinvent the wheel. So this is a technology uh, possibility. We need, with a, a well operation uh, platform that automate, uh, automatizes and integrates the data for the well design. We can also start uh, to create engineering, new engineering simulations because we, we free engineers not to keep collecting data, but we free engineers to think about new engineering simulations that should be done to improve safety and performance. And also we can integrate that with uh, the, the workflow approval and monitor the whole managerial process for the well design. So those are the, 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 the strategic intelligence that we can deliver when we think about uh, design automation, well, design automation. We saw some, we have one customer very successful on that. When we talk about uh, RTOC centers, uh, we want, we have important drivers. We need to apply RTOC at scale. And what does it mean? What do, do an operator has an RTOC? They want to, to guarantee that all the corporate risks are being monitored and have the barriers in place. So we need to move, improve the operational uh, safety awareness, moving from today where engineers are doing the tasks and are looking to many dashboards to a, 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 a RTOC where the RTOC activities are based on the corporation's risk and we have contextualized the dashboards based on the engineering or on the operation that is going on. We need also to, to have an engineering abstraction that, as I mentioned, we need to think rules, engineering rules that allow to expand and have more flexible uh, modeling so we can accelerate innovation, experimentation. Uh, we, we have today workflows that are highly human dependent we need to have more automated workflows. That's a requirement in a, in, a, in a platform that we can use today. 
And also we have created the concept of augmented engineer intelligence. That's it's when humans are cooperate, cooperating with machines. So we can have augmented engineers. They are the machine learning models when they have some uncertainty or so, some ambiguity, ask for a human feedback. So humans can teach the machine learning models and the machine learning models can give insights for humans. And also humans can share knowledge with uh, humans. That's what we have been calling augmented in intelligence and delivering augmented engineers in the RTOC center, in the RTOCs. So how can you do that? We need a real-time platform where we deliver the sensors. Uh, the sensors are available with quality. We can create KPIs and, and dashboards that can be contextualized based on the operation that is going on. But for sure, we need to review the RTOC processes. We need to reinvent the RTOC processes considering that we need to do a different engineering, that we need to do uh, the maximum use of AI or supervisory prescriptive machine learning and AI models that autom autom automatize uh, risks identification, for example, or automatize performance improvement. And we can even create RTOC KPIs in order to measure the value of this RTOC team. And when we do that, it's much easier to prove the value of RTOC, the RTOC. Inside uh, many different companies, usually it's very difficult to, to, to communicate the value of the RTOC because it's very, uh, we usually do not monitor the RTOC KPIs and generated value. Once we can do that inside a platform, aggregate this value, generate reports that show how many times the RTOC team helped the field operation to save, uh, to avoid losses or to improve performance, we are going to easier, uh, we are going easier, uh, in an easier way, uh, show the value of this RTOC team. Here, just sharing some uh, insights, we can focus the real-time performance uh, for risk, risk awareness here with a bow tie and you can connect the barriers uh, with the real-time data and see, have the awareness in real time. We can see how the ship is doing with the inspection planning and correlate that with uh, some non-compliances reports. We can integrate uh, surface systems with subsurface subsea systems and see those uh, sensors in an integrated way. That's uh, those are examples of how our customers are applying RTOC at scale to improve their operations. And uh, I would like to emphasize here: this is the takeaway of this presentation that I would really like. Uh, if you need to go away with something, with is, it is with this slide. Uh, I, I recently created the, the expression augmented engineering uh, because with the new data uh, volume that we have available, with the new technologies that are available and the capability to rethink processes, we can transform the way that we operate. And when we talk about engineering uh, industries to change the way they operate, we need to change the way that we do engineering. So the first very, very big uh, pillar on that is IoT. We need to have the convergence of the real world with the digital world. So we need to collect the data with the sensors. This data need to be available, have quality, be synchronized and integrated so with that, we can observe the real world. We can know what's going on. It's that what uh, IoT platform allows us. But we need to integrate the observed reality that we now can represent in the digital world with expect, expected values. So how can we create expected values to automate decision and actions? One dimension is digital twin. When we talk about digital twin, we mean by that, that we should be doing in real time simulations, can be steady state simulations, can be transient simulations to create an expected value. 
And when we have the expected value compared with the observed value, we can create insights and alarms to take better decisions. That's what digital twin do and does, and that's what digital twin allows us to improve safety, integrity, and compliance in our operations. The same thing can happen well, before moving to machine learning and AI. Uh, we should be asking us, ourselves if we have the models available to be run in real time to be able to apply digital twin. I saw many digital twin projects start as a digital twin project and end up as a data, a, 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 a data quality project or a, simulate, a simulation development so, uh, project. Why? Because the digital twin is the end of the line. You need to come back to the basics. Do you have the observed value to apply a comparison with the digital twin? Do we have the real-time model to run? Sometimes when we ask ourselves about that, the answer is no. So we cannot do a digital twin project if we don't have the right simulator and we don't have the data available. And it's exactly the same thing when you talk about machine learning and AI. But to enter in a machine learning project or AI project, we need data annotated. I saw many projects to struggle, starting as a machine learning uh, as a machine learning project, and when they start, the science the data science team asks for the annotated data, and they see they don't have enough annotated data to train the model, and we end up. We start as a machine learning or AI project, and we end up as a data notation project. And sometimes, not only a data notation project, but also a data gathering project, because we many times when we create a machine learning model, we discover that we don't have enough data to do the machine learning in real time. So though my recommendation, and that's why I'm emphasizing the importance of the platform. We need to be able to have a foundation where we can innov accelerate innovation that unleashes people, data, and technology potentials. That's why the, 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 the software is the foundation, the strong foundation in which we are going to create those, construct those pillars. And when we have an annotated database and we can train the machine learning model, we need to deploy that in real time and compare the expected with the observed. And once we compare doing classifications, doing predictions, even sometimes creating context, the right context, that's the way that we create a corporate knowledge. We can start generating for the engineering team alarms and uh, insights from the machine learning model. And that's when the machine learning model cooperates with the engineers. That's when we have an augmented intelligence, when engineers give feedback to the machine learning. It's when we have augmented engineers that get insights from the machine. And when we review all those processes and we try to automate processes and equipments, to deliver consistency and process safety is exactly when we are fully transforming our way to operate, delivering business results as safety, integrity, compliance, and performance. And automation is highly related with safety, integrity, and compliance. We want to reduce the standard deviation of the process and the failures on the processes. So, we need to be able to have a platform that allows us to do that, to improve the maturity of, of all of those pillars and to integrate all of those pillars. This is the challenge and that's why I really recommend to come back to the basics, make a benchmark, see the, the, the companies that are, or the areas that are being successful and ask them which are the, the platforms that you are using and use those platforms, those companies as reference and find the, the platform that can 
uh, unleash the potential of your company. So exactly, uh, we need to accelerate the, the, all the industry's transformations. This is going to happen if we inspire and we unleash the augmented engineering champions to innovate. We need to find those guys. There are many early adopters engineers that are ready to change the processes. We need to find them. We need to give the right tool to them and allow them to innovate, to change the way that we operate. We are going to do, they are going to do that by maximizing the safety, maximizing the integrity, minimizing risk, and maximizing performance. Uh, for doing that, they are going to automate equipment supervision and processes, applying IoT, digital twin, and machine learning and AI. And with AI and machine learning, we are going to be able to build a corporate knowledge that will potentialize the business results. And something that I really want to stimulate companies to do when we talk about engineering we have a lot of room to improve in terms of engineering availability and reliability by design and at operational decisions. And the technology allows us to really improve the quality and the capability that we have in terms of engineering availability, engineering reliability in our way to operate. And why Intelli feels so comfortable to talk about that is because our platform is based on three pillars. We have a plug and play solutions that accelerates uh, what our customer can deliver, but also we give them the flexibility to edit the dashboards and the workflows to comply with their internal business uh, decisions, their business models. We have both things together because we, we Re really believe that this will unleash uh, innovation potential. We have a platform that can deal with high frequency data and, get, and put in place ways to synchronize the clock of this data to deal with high bandwidth, manage the backlog, guarantee data quality, create uh, virtual sensors to compare the, the, the simulated the data with the observed data. We can even have auto switch and data function uh, tools. So with that, we create the right scenario for taking decisions from data because bad data, bad de decisions. We cannot take good decisions if we have based on data, if we have bad data. And finally, this is our, uh, our uh, let's say secret sauce we see machine learning and artificial intelligence as a way to augment the human intelligence. And it's a way that we need to keep humans in the loop, but we need to keep humans doing the right job that were done to, be to humans. That is innovate, deal with ambiguity, give feedbacks to the... To the to the machine learning models. So here we have two types of augmented engineers. We have the augmented engineers that are going to cooperate with artificial intelligence uh, models. They are going to receive micro reports, micro knowledge. They are going to feed, give, uh, give annotations, uh, fulfill micro forms. But also this is one level. That's the level when we cooperate with the artificial intelligence. But there's another level of augmented engineers. There are those that are called champions. There are those that, are, that know the technologies and know how to reinvent the engineering, how to reinvent the processes and to deliver ways that we can do things with one click action and to automate processes for engineers and to have how to create just-in-time knowledge to share with the operational engineers that are going to receive the insight from the AI models, the, the artificial intelligence models. So with that, I conclude the presentation. I, I really hope that you enjoyed. Once again, I would like very much to, to thank the Atme organization team that invited us, Geoservices, 
uh, that also is an important partner uh, from us at Indonesia. Uh, I here uh, leave my email if anybody of you wants to go through specific cases and uh, have a little bit more uh, understanding of what was uh, talked today. I'm open to, 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 to answer questions. And also I'd like to emphasize that we are hiring. So uh, we, we have uh, this website for hiring uh, developers and engineers to help us in this journey to transform data into results fast and delivering business value to our customers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Borrella. What an excellent presentation. Uh, knowledge sharing, very uh, useful and very interesting for me as well. I believe uh, uh, the other participants feel the same with me. And then, uh, okay, uh, for now, we'll go ahead and take some time uh, for questions. As a reminder, please be sure to type uh, your question into the question box in your uh, Zoom uh, chat box uh, below. So I'm open for uh, a few questions from the participants. We have now total uh, 58 participants in our webinar today. Any question, you may raise uh, your hand and then you may ask directly to Dr. Borella. If not, maybe uh, I can um, ask a question, Dr. Borella. I'm really interesting to... Uh, ah, this uh, one guy raised hand. Yeah, let me check. Uh, Mr. M V. Yeah. Um, my name okay. is Marda. Uh, Dr. Borella, uh, I would like to ask you one question. Uh, some say that the innovation can be pushed through a launch faster technologies or method than iterate later, right? Uh, in this case, in the oil and gas industry that you saying before that the risk is inherent in the operation. Uh, I'm thinking that, or I'm seeing that a innovation is kind of, well, it's not as much as what we're seeing in the downstream market. So upstream, little bit lack of innovation, right? So I just want to know, uh, how is your views on that? Why, why the upstreams uh, quite uh, way behind than the downstream or even the market uh, digitalization? Thank you. Very, very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the, the, our upstream industry is very, has the last years relied on R&D uh, development. And R&D research and development usually is applied to improve operational limits. For example, higher depth, uh, higher pressure, higher temperature. But this is one way to innovate. It's not the only way to innovate. And you were used to innovate only doing R&D. With the new technologies that those technologies are more software dependent, we can create uh, what we call sandboxes. That is a place, a safe place where we can train, we can exercise, fail fast, not impact the operation. And when we are, uh, we are uh, safe with the model that we created, we can deploy that uh, in the operation. So uh, we, we have a mindset to do research and development. And uh, when we talk about innovation, research and development, it's one way to innovate. We need to have a broader way to innovate. To, to have a broader mindset to innovate. And when we change this mindset, we start to accelerate, okay? Uh, it's just the way that we relied in our operations. And I can tell you, I was functional manager. We have gone through a, a regulation change in Brazil. That was an important regulation change in terms to improve operation safety. 
And uh, we only could comply with better with the regulation when we automated things to guarantee that we had no non-conformities, that all the processes were being applied systematically. That was a huge change. So the regulation uh, uh, drive, drove us to, to, to automate a process to guarantee compliance. So we need those two mindsets. One, it's to move from R&D to innovation, innovation in general. And the second one is to, to accept that automation, automating processes is a way to improve compliance, is not a way of course, we need a methodology before deploying the technology, but uh, once we deploy it, we guarantee that the whole fleet is applying the same rules and all those rules are being verified 24 hours a day, seven days per week. And uh, am I, if you allow me, I have, uh, uh, in my previous company, I have incentivated the executives uh, to create the directory for innovation we hadn't that in the company. And uh, I consider my key contribution was to, before leaving, be able to approve the directory of innovation. So that was an example how to materialize this mindset change. In the past, we had only the research center, and now we, they have the, the innovation directory. So that's a symbol that shows to the company what should drive their new mindset. And uh, if I, uh, I, I could give an advice, my suggestion is try to start talking about innovation in general, to understand that we, keep, we need to keep doing research and development, R&D, but we need to make that become broader. Everybody, innovation is about everybody should innovate every time, anywhere. Thank you, uh, Dr. Borella. Is there any uh, further question from Mr. MV from what uh, Dr. Borella explained? Okay, uh, so doctor, you think that uh, we could apply a, a sandbox like a, uh, what, what you call like a, a safe place uh, to have a, a trial for everything that uh, could have innovate our way uh, to operate the the oil and gas, especially in the upstreams, yeah. Because uh, to to be honest, uh, what I'm seeing right now is uh, more like a continuous improvement than innovation. Because yes, uh, I think that's a really good suggestion that uh, we are should start to have a, a sandbox like uh, what the what the what the Google or uh, everyone right now have. That uh, we need to have that, but uh, I mean. There's still uh, many things that uh, the oil and gas industry need to be done, which is such as a data open yeah? open data. I mean, uh, that uh, we can uh, have or collect many uh, operational uh, actual condition that already happened so that uh, we can try to mimic that in, the, in that sandbox itself. Then when we can play uh, with uh, our new method or our new workflow that really innovate uh, the way we operate, uh, then uh, uh, there will be a, a, a safe uh, for us uh, to, to, to try to emulate everything on that sandbox, rather than a, 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 a just stuck with the continuous improvement without innovation. Well, uh, thank you for your uh, suggestion, Doctor. I think, uh, yeah, uh, we need to try that here. Yeah, uh, it, 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 you, you, very well summarized, that's it. It's very easy to be said, it's not easy to be done because we need to convince people. And, and when you talk about corporations, a good idea is only a good idea, not because you believe on that, but because you convince other people about that, because you need to align everybody in the same direction. So that's why sometimes when you talk about digital transformation, we need, uh, we need a top-down support. Of course, we need a, a bottom-up execution, but you need a top-down support. For example, uh, you rightly mentioned that we need to understand the maturity where we are and provide what, uh, we should select a problem in the business and see the maturity. We have the data, yes, we have the data. 
do you have the sandbox? No, so let's create the sandbox. So do, do you know, uh, do we have a team, once we create the sandbox, do we have a team that is trying to innovate? No, so let's put the team in place. And the decisions are really based on, on financial results. So do we have uh, resources directed, uh, reserved for innovating? If the answer is no, you are going to prioritize operation. That's human. Every manager does that. So, uh, and uh, so, great companies to evaluate their, their 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 maturity level. Usually, they they ask for strategic consultancy teams. They are very specialized at that. They have public information. Many of them. Uh, I'll not mention one specifically, but. All of them have websites where you can find uh, tips to accelerating digital transformation. And uh, once uh, you, you, so they, they have many questions and many uh, things that they use to evaluate the maturity. But one important thing uh, that uh, for me is an important driver to evaluate maturity is if the company was able to state that the company is cloud first. As you saw in my presentation, for me, one key change in the world was the cloud creation. creation. And uh, that's why Microsoft had to transform their business and move to the cloud, because the cloud was invented by uh, Amazon. And uh, Amazon was getting the, the Microsoft market. So my, uh, Microsoft had to, to, to transform themselves. They, they were pretty fast. They were pretty fast. Uh, so if a company is not able to state that is cloud first, um, my opinion, they are not going to be able to innovate digitally because they are not going to have the right tools to, to, to have the right platform or uh, the right hardware to run, uh, to create the sandbox and run prototypes and, and innovate. Of course, when we talk about cloud first, if we are uh, incumbent companies that already have in place a data center or we have a legacy to deal with, it's hard, it's difficult. It's difficult to fully migrate to cloud. It's going to take a time, but we should, we should be migrating. Even those that have a legacy, they should be migrating. They should be maximize, at least maximizing the use of cloud. They should be cloud first, doesn't mean all in cloud. Of course, for new companies, small companies or technology companies that don't have legacy, it's easy to state, I am cloud first or I am cloud only. Intel is cloud only, okay? But it's a technology company, we don't have legacy. Okay, so it, it's easier, I acknowledge that. But we need to enter the journey. The journey is long to, to, to move from a company that is not cloud first to become a company cloud first, there's a journey. And the sooner we start, the faster we are going to deliver and the faster we are going to be able to innovate. So for sure, your suppliers that are used to do that can support you. So. Uh, in La Intelli has a tool, a platform that we can deploy in your data center, we can deploy in cloud, in your cloud or in our cloud. So with that, we, we, we help our customers to being ready to migrate from data, data, uh, data centers to cloud because our, our, our tool is ag it's agnostic. We can, we can have any configuration. So with that, we help them in, our, in their journey to be cloud first. Thank you uh, for the explanation, uh, Dr. Borella. Yeah. Again, to all participants, uh, you may raise uh, your hands to ask uh, for a question or type in a Zoom chat box. If not, uh, maybe I can ask a question, Dr. Borella. Uh, I saw in your uh, takeaway presentation about the augmented engineering. Basically, there are four from the IoT, digital twin, ML and AI, and automation. Actually, uh, one thing that uh, it's not uh, it's less uh, familiar for me is about the digital twin. 
I'm interesting to uh, your explanation about this is a real time simulation to create an expected value. It is an uh, creating alarm and insights. Can you uh, please dig more about uh, the concept of this uh, digital twin? Doctor? For Thank sure. You Thank you. For sure. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, the, 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 uh, an example that I, I, I can share, for example, uh, is uh, when we are drilling and uh, we, we can have a washout. There's a puncture in the drilling string and this puncture can uh, become a drill string fail failure and uh, we can lose time during the operation and sometimes even lo lose the well. So how could we apply a digital twin on that? We can collect the actual data, for example, which this, the string is in the well, which is the well uh, path, which, are, which is the, the, the flow rate, the weight on bit, and have a real-time simulator that is calculating the expected pressure for this scenario, operational scenario. And you can compare the measured pressure with the calculated pressure. And when we have a deviation on that, we can, let's say, expect if it's a model that intends to identify our shout. So we are going to raise a flag and say, look, the difference, the difference between the expected value pressure is 10 to the, the observed pressure is 10. So we can create criteria. Is the pressure drop is, uh, is 10 PSI per minute? we should take a look on that. So we have a, a customer that uh, have avoided many, many public, with public uh, information that they have avoided many washout events just using digital twin, just predicting the expected pressure in the system, comparing that with the observed pressure. And when the variation of this, this calculation changed, they could uh, prevent and predict uh, wash out events before humans. Yeah, and, 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 and you can do that in a like, very broader way. Yeah, it just uh, you can compare many. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think we have like. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, uh, this is like uh, raising a flag uh, to. Uh, inform the users that there will be uh, some uh, such of uh, an event, the unexpected event, basically. Yeah. So this is for uh, safety uh, matters, I believe. Yeah. More to for, that. One. For yeah, for safety, but also for performance. We can we, we can say, for example, we can treat being out of of the best per, uh, optimum performance as a, a top event, a risk top event. Because at the end of the day, you want to be in the optimum performance. If you are not, it's a, a risk that has been manifested. So we can also uh, to use, but of course that depends. And, and, and that's a little bit, that's why uh, we have created this slide because it's tricky. When we talk about digital transformation, uh, we are talking about all this together. But when we try to solve up one problem, Sometimes we select one of those pillars. It's very difficult to, to apply all of them in only one problem. So for example, this customer, he decided to avoid washout. Why? Because he evaluated that he was losing too many money or losing performance uh, because of washout. But we have another uh, uh, customer that he wants to create a machine learning model that couples a real-time transient simulation to compare with the sensors data to avoid stuck pipe because they are losing performance because of stuck pipe. So we start from the problem and the decision to pick up a problem is based on the impact that it has in your, in your operation. So we start from, from the problem with the fine this problem is my key issue right now. I'm losing millions of dollars because of stuck pipe. So let's create a project that will solve the stack or predict or improve the capability to avoid stuck pipe. And then we decide, do I have the data available for doing that? Do I need a real-time simulation? Do I need a machine learning model 
uh, that uses uh, historical data annotated, can we automate the actions? For example, can we automate to improve uh, the mud weight? Most probably not. So instead of automating, we are going to create an alarm that gives us an insight to the RTOC uh, that says, look, you risk to have a uh, 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 stuck pipe. We recommend you to evaluate, improve the mud weight. Call the rig. So the RTOC guy will call the rig and they are discussed together if they are going to improve the mud weight or not, or to improve the, the flow rate. So sometimes you can automate, sometimes you cannot. So you rewrite the, the, the project based on uh, what you have available. And that's, that, 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 that's very, there are many trick scenarios that you can face. You know, was uh, a few weeks ago, I was in a presentation and I said, look, to, 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 uh, to identify possible equipment failures, you should be comparing the input energy with the output energy. And if the difference between those two energies is uh, augmenting, that means that you are losing energy in your system. So you have some loss. Most probably you have a leakage, or you have some failure in the system that you should be looking at. And the guy said, look, okay, I understand that, Borella, but you need uh, the mud weight to calculate the output energy. And I don't have this sensor. I said, great. So we need to solve the problem considering that you don't have the sensor. And that's a lack in our technology available. And I shared with him that when I was R&D manager, I put a project that the project was how to monitor fluid mud weight property in real time, because I needed that as input. But I don't even had the right sensor. So I had to create the sensor to collect the data to have better model. So we need to understand where we are and to have the, this this understanding of the maturity of the technology is key when we start the project. It's key to define where we can get and it's key to define what we are going to do. And sometimes, as I mentioned, maybe we need to create an R&D project to create a new sensor. I saw, I, I personally have created at least three or four projects to, to create new sensors because we don't even have the sensor available. In, in the humanity knowledge, the humanity whole capability, the sensor was not available. We had to create it. Cool, cool. Excellent uh, explanation, doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have uh, one girl, uh, Miss Safia. Miss Safia, uh, you may ask your, your question to Dr. Borel. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just use uh, my daughter, uh, my daughter account, so his name is Safia, but uh, my name is Fami. I'm just question about the, if any company with the ranging of the drilling operation starting from onshore operation with the limit of uh, internet and then uh, for the sending and receiving data, then this company that uh, have a submersible itself, so it's quite ranging operation with internet world do you prefer to use uh, to as a data center like a standalone or uh, maybe uh, another way to uh, gather or collect data maybe like uh, just like that uh, thanks very 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 good question thank you very much uh, for the question because oh, we need to balance uh, of course, uh, sometimes we, we, we have the feeling that the bandwidth from remote areas is a limitation. Uh, but that depends on the technological architecture that you use. Because one thing is uh, when you collect the data from the field and you send to the, to the cloud. So just to have uh, now, once Intel is a Viasat company, we have the end-to-end -end solution. So we have uh, via start you launch an, a third generation of satellites that will improve highly the capability of data transmission and co uh, world coverage with our satellites and uh, for remote areas. So we are in the, we are uh, improving the technology of, of bandwidth to exceed remote areas, but also sometimes the 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 time that we need to take the decision can wait a few minutes. 
uh, we, we say real time and we have in our imagination that real time is second base. But sometimes we have room for minutes, even hours, depending for, for example, for refineries, you have hours to take a decision. You don't need to take decisions second by second or change the, the, of course, you need to balance that. There are some control loops that need to be on the edge and some control and some control loops that you, you can put in the cloud. So you, you need to, to evaluate that on the problem basis. What we have is have been seeing right now is even our most uh, our customers that use the most of sensors from the rig, they are not facing right now issues with uh, data bandwidth right now. Okay, of course we are trying to improve the automation, and as we improve the automation, we are going to move to the edge, and we have us. Our platform allows you to balance that. You can choose what you do in the edge and what you do in the cloud. And of course, uh, we are going to calibrate that based on your bandwidth and based on your prob uh, the problems that you want to solve. Okay. And uh, the good news is when we have the Viasat uh, third generation satellites, we are going to be able to deliver high bandwidth in the whole world. Thank you very much, Dr. Morella. Uh, Mr. Fahmi, Fahmi, any 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 other things you want to add? Yeah, uh, maybe uh, we can choose the different platform itself. Uh, maybe we have a standalone itself, and then we can share the offline data with another uh, tools. Maybe with the maybe with the limited data itself, but uh, uh, do you have already already have a platform with the different, with the, what you call the, compensate the limited data itself, yeah, Pak Borello, yeah. yeah. But, but, but it's a very good point. We have some customers that use a different company and that's uh, customers that use our whole solution. And as I mentioned, we have today the capability to integrate systems or have a net of system so it's it's really a customer based decision on their architecture and what they have in contract and uh, uh, the, their preferences but we are very flexible on terms of of data transmission architecture okay thank you so much for the explanation doctor uh, again all participants maybe uh, if uh, you guys want to ask a question, maybe uh, we still have uh, sometimes like uh, five minutes. Okay, open for question, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Uh, if there are no one uh, asking about uh, the topic to Dr. Borella, I think uh, it looks like we have uh, already covered uh, all of the questions, Dr. Borella. And then uh, from you, is there anything else uh, you wanted to cover before our wrap up? I uh, uh, really want like to, to thank the warm re reception. I felt very, very well received and very glad to be here today. I enjoyed a lot to do the presentation. I don't know if you could manage to, 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 to uh, see that, but I enjoyed a lot, very good questions. I'm very motivated by this topic and uh, we are open to share experiences and knowledge to accelerate our in industry. Thank you very much once again. And I, I'd like really to give a special thank to to Susanna. Susanna, thank you very much for making that possible. Our pleasure. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Bola. I would like to uh, sum up uh, what we have uh, discussed uh, today. It's about the uh, data, how important the data is. Uh, the main uh, objective is how to generate a business value from the data. Uh, and then uh, the data analysis uh, really affecting uh, the decision and action. Again, it still needs uh, human participation, acknowledge and also the feedback. 
And then uh, for me as well, uh, doctor, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm thinking that uh, the, the machine learning and AI is not a uh, vibranium that uh, make uh, Wakanda people in uh, Black Panther movies uh, creating a superhuman power. I'm thinking that the uh, machine learning and AI is like an uh, aluminum in a human perspective. It is uh, uh, useful for the automotive industry, the households and any other industry uh, surrounding us. So I believe uh, learning about the machine learning and AI, it uh, creates uh, a value. It makes us uh, learn and increase our knowledge to use the data as much as possible to create uh, a good business result and also creating value to the company. I believe uh, I tried to sum up. I believe we are all agree about that. Okay, uh, before we close uh, the webinar today, may you guys uh, turn on your camera video so we can take a group photo session before we close uh, the webinar. Uh, Mas uh, Adnan, Mas Rizky, and Mas Osa, uh, appreciate your help to take uh, photos for us. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please open the, your video so we can see. Si dikit nih yang buka kamera nih. Buka kamera, buka kamera, yo. Ini kita tunggu dulu beberapa saat sebelum kita ambil ya, Pak. Ya, siap. Semuanya boleh buka kamera. <laughs> Semuanya bu. <laughs> Jadi kelihatan rame gitu. Iya. Yeah. Oh, Ibu Safea yang namanya Pak Fahmi ya. itu. Pak Fahmi ya. Pak Fahmi dari mana, Pak Fahmi? Lihat, Pak. Uh, saya dari uh, PHWM. Oh, uh, oh. oh oke. Okay. Oke, okay. okay, mungkin bisa kita ambil sekarang, Pak. Ya, yeah. oke. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mohon ditahan dulu untuk posenya, nah, karena ada beberapa panel. Untuk panel yang pertama, satu, dua, dan tiga. Oke, selanjutnya mohon untuk ditahan untuk posenya, satu, dua, tiga. Oke, sekali lagi, satu, dua, tiga. Oke, thank you. Oke, okay, thank you very much Dr. Morella, yeah. Ibu Susana. Terima kasih Dr. Morella, Ibu Susana. Ibu Susana. Mas Rian, Mas Adnan, Mas Rizky, thank you. Thank you Mas Susana, thank you Dr. Morella. Thank you guys. Thank you team, we appreciate you. Thank you Rizky. Thank you so much. Thank you Adnan, Pak Rizky. Mas Rian, ketemu di Jakarta ya. Kita langsung ketemu di Jakarta. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.